Hello and welcome to Food Safety Fridays. My name is Simon Timpley from the International Food Safety and Quality Network. Uh, our special guest presenter today is Guido Manka from Eagle Product Inspection. And the topic today is uncover the truth behind X-ray product inspection. So welcome, Guido, your first time with us. Nice to, nice to have you along. How are you doing? I'm fine. Thank you, Simon. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for, uh, to our attendants for joining today. Good, good. So we asked the audience to type in the sidebar and tell us where they're joining us from. Uh, as you can see there, Mexico mm -hmm. City, Paolo, Missouri, Zachary. So where are you joining us from today, Guido? I'm uh, joining from Walbach. That's a small town in Germany, close to Frankfurt. Very good. And I'm, as always, in uh, place called Ramsbottom in the UK. Uh, right, so we'll get the sponsor ads on, uh, three minutes, and then we'll come back for the presentation. So see you on the other side. Thank you. The world of food has changed a lot in the last hundred years. But one thing that doesn't change? Ensuring the quality and safe handling of food. No matter what changes are yet to come, we're proud to always be on our client's side, shaping the future of food today and tomorrow. AIB International, ever onward. back uh and the last advert was eagle products inspection and uh this presentation is from guido from eagle so let's get the slides up uh without further ado if you can hold your questions till uh the end we'll have q a after the presentation so otherwise the, the questions will just get lost okay so i'll hand you over to guido now and i'll be back for the q a later okay great so uh, I'll start right away. Uh, welcome everybody to our presentation on the most frequently asked questions on X-ray inspection technology. And 
Um, my name is Guido Manke. I will be presenting this session. I'm working for Eagle Product Inspection as an R&D systems engineer, and I'm a physicist, I graduated uh, from University of Göttingen in 2008, and was previously working in the film coating industry, where we also did a lot of measurements and uh, inspection of coatings. And then, yeah, I joined Eagle, and now I'm inspecting food, but taking a lot of care about the X-ray inspection sensors and the calibration methods we use. And uh, with this, I would like to start the session. So our agenda for today, I have uh, six questions and then the Q&A session. So first we'll start about explaining how safe X-ray inspection is for both for the people who operate the inspection machines and also for the food. Second, we talk about what you can expect to find with X-ray inspection technology. Third, we're going to do an excourse on bone detection with X-ray in food. Um, talk about inline fat analysis. And later, uh, I'll show you also which other quality checks can be done using X-ray inspection. And I'll conclude with uh, the accuracy of X-ray detection and how this can be characterized. And then we go to the Q&A session. So let's start uh, with the safety first. How safe is X-ray inspection? And yeah, you have heard about X-ray inspection, probably had medical X-rays already. Uh, X-rays are considered to be ionizing radiation. This means it's a radiation which is um, powerful enough to ionize atoms. And if that's happening uh, to life uh, organisms, for example, to people, this may be harmful. That's why we need to make sure the X-ray inspection systems are shielded so that, that no X-rays hit the people. Um, X-rays are an electromagnetic wave, uh, also gamma rays are. Uh, or light waves, as you know it, or microwaves, but X-rays have higher energy compared to uh, light waves or microwaves, and gamma ray rays would be uh, even more uh, energetic than X-rays. So um, this is a bit different than, for example, radioactive radiation you get. Uh, this is caused by um, atoms really uh, decaying. So the atoms, the material is radioactive and you will get radiation from this all of the time. But X-rays are generated by an X-ray source which can be switched on and off. So it's generated from electrical energy and it's uh, only generated when it's switched on. So it's safe if an X-ray machine is off, you push the stop button, switch it off, push emergency stop, all the X-ray radiation is off within um, yeah, fractions of a second. So um, yeah, then a little bit about the, the radiation, uh, how it's quantified. Um, and when we talk about radiation, we characterize it by the energy which is absorbed per mass of um, product you you uh, radiate the X-rays to, or if people get exposed to X-rays, the, the energy absorbed in their body. And that would be uh, the unit gray, which is one joule of energy per kilogram of mass, which is not a lot, but because it's high energy, it could uh, yeah, potentially be harmful. So it's important to shield the X-rays and not expose people. Um, the radiation for the measurement certificates you get will be um, given in the so-called equivalent dose, which also considers the biological effects and uh, makes different kinds of radiation comparable. And there's a weighing factor and the unit is no longer called gray, but sievert. So um, X-rays are just converted like one, one gray of X-ray uh, converts into one sievert, but other types of radiation will have higher factors up to 20. And we know in our environment, there's X-rays um, not only from uh, artificial sources like the, the X-ray generators, but there are also natural sources. So um, everybody is exposed to radiation through his entire life. And that's um, roughly 2.4 millisievert a year from natural sources of radiation. So the, the actual numbers vary depending on where you live, whether it's more like one millisievert or um, if you're in a mountain area, maybe you are closer to 10 millisievert. And the, the top contributors to this are cosmic rays from, from uh, charged particles from the sun arriving. Um, and also radon gas, which is um, coming from the soil. So it's maybe accumulated in buildings, especially in on the lower floors and you can inhale it. So these are natural sources. And then, yeah, um, 
cosmic radiation is especially uh, important if you're on the aircraft, you're closer to the sky, so you get higher radiation doses. And this adds up to, yeah, as I said, average 2.4 millisievert a year. And compared to this, the X-ray machines are shielded. So next to an X-ray machine, uh, the exposure you could get is uh, only 0 0.01 millisievert per hour. So um, that's yeah one order of magnitude less compared to what you have in, in natural sources. So um, it shows you the, the radiation is at very low level next to an X-ray machine. And this makes it safe for workers. So um, it's it's not doing harm to people working next to an X-ray. And you don't need to wear a dosimeter or something, which you might do when you work with medical X-rays, because the machines are fully shielded and will be inspected on site that all the radiation stays inside. And as we heard, it's safe for the operators uh, to operate the X-ray machine. The other question is, does the X-ray do any harm to food? And um, there's um, two kinds of radiation we, we hear about when we talk about food. One would be um, inspection with X-rays to find contaminants. And the other would be um, yeah, irradiation of food for destroying bacteria. But that's a completely different technology and involves much higher radiation doses. So that's not what we are talking about today. We are just making a short X-ray, uh, yeah, which you can imagine like um, similar to a medical X-ray, but for food. And um, the, the time uh, and the amount of X-rays used is really short. So in 1997, a WHO study showed that X-raying doesn't cause harm to food. And also food wouldn't lose the status of organic food when it's X-rayed. So um, there's no, no change of flavor or shelf life or anything which uh, happens in the food when it's being X-rayed. So it's safe for both the operators and also for the food and for you as a food processor to use X-rays. So how are the machines designed to be this safe? So here's a um, sketch on the bottom side uh, looking <laughs> through the cross-section of an X-ray system. And on the right side, there's such an X-ray system. So on the left, you see A would be the X-ray source, which is a generator, which uses electric power to generate the X-rays, which are then narrowed down by some, some collimation, we call it. So it's a very narrow beam, just uh, exiting the generator and hitting a detector, which is denoted with B in this sketch. And there's a circle drawn, which would be the conveyor belt going around and tr um, transporting your product through the X-ray beam. And when an product is in the X-ray beam, X-rays get absorbed and we get uh, an image uh, comparing the, the X-ray beam before and the X-ray beam uh, when the product travels through. Um, so the image shows how much X-rays are absorbed in which area of the product. And C is a computer which then gets the data from the X-ray detector and runs software to analyze it and do all the uh, further downstream processing, rejecting of contaminated products and so on. And again, when no power is supplied to the X-ray source, the machine is off. On the right side, you see uh, that <laughs> these components are embedded in a yeah, solid machine, mostly made of stainless steel. And on top there is a so-called stack light, which signalizes when the X-rays are on. And I will switch to the next page. So here's a little bit more about the, the safety and the way how X-rays are absorbed. So um, as it is an electromagnetic wave, uh, it follows some, some absorption law, uh, which, is, which is an exponential decrease. So you have an intensity denoted here with I, or I naught is the initial intensity. And then when you pass through a matter, for example, your product or also some shielding material, the remaining intensity I will be I naught times E to the minus mu which is a material constant times the thickness of the material. So uh, mu, we call it the coefficient of absorption. That's um, a number which quantifies how strong a certain material is absorbing X-rays. And as a rule of thumb, the heavy atoms, like in metals and so on, absorb X-rays stronger than the lighter atoms, such as carbon or oxygen, which you mainly find in food.
And the other um, factor here is the thickness. So um, the thicker the material is, which is passed by the X-rays, the larger the absorption is. And uh, from this, uh, you can tell like materials absorbing stronger will <laughs> create a, a better contrast in the X-ray image. Right? And also, um, it tells you which materials to use for shielding the X-rays. So on the left side, there's a sketch uh, showing different types of radiation. So alpha and beta radiation would be particles, which can be absorbed by paper or plastic. For X-rays, we, we prefer to use some uh, heavier atoms with high Z numbers to absorb it. So starting from stainless steel and then depending on where you use it, also copper or brass are good absorbers or also lead and special compounds. And then here there's also gamma rays which are more energetic. So even lead would be used but could still be uh, penetrated depending on the thickness. And on the right side, you see basically the X-ray source, which is surrounded by some shielding here. It's denoted with copper and some collimation, um, which narrows down the beam that the beam is really focused not to go in any direction, but just down to the detector and the food running on the conveyor through the X-ray beam. And on the next page, you can see uh, again an X-ray system. Um, on top, you see the so-called step light, stack light, which needs to be visible uh, around, from all around the machine. And when red light comes on, this means the X-ray source is active. So then you shouldn't put uh, anything uh, of your body inside the X-ray beam. Um, and there's emergency stops all over the machine. Um, which then in case something goes wrong, a product jam happens or something can just be put and the, the X-rays will be off instantaneously. And also the doors or apertures on the machine, which can be open for sanitizing or uh, clearing product jams and stuff like this are interlocked. So if you by accident would open such a door, X-rays would switch off automatically even if you had forgotten to turn it off before. So there's a lot of safety measures to make sure nobody get, gets exposed to X-rays. And the machine is, is made of sufficiently thick material to properly shield the X-rays. And uh, then you have the so-called tunnel where the products enter and exit the machine. And there you have uh, curtains. Uh, these are also uh, um, materials which absorb X-rays well, but are flexible. So there's these these uh, type of food contact allowing flexible absorber materials or for other applications the curtains can also be uh, stainless steel um, and you also don't need to be afraid when a product goes passes through the curtain it would open the curtain a little bit but there's multiple layers of curtains throughout the machine so even <laughs> one curtain is open another curtain will still block the x-rays and uh, to operate an X-ray machine, you typically need to get uh, your local authorities to approve it. And you also uh, need a radiation safety officer, which knows about how to handle X-rays and to take off care of the machine. So all these measure uh, precautions make it safe to operate X-ray machines in your facilities. And so how does the X-ray system catch foreign bodies? Here's again the sketch of the conveyor belt with the products running through. You have the X-ray beam here. It's indicated as a yeah, narrow so-called fan beam. Um, and the detector is below the beam. So when the product runs through the beam, uh, the image, the attenuation of the X-rays is captured and an image is formed by the uh, detector and it's displayed on the computer. And again, on top, you have the X-ray source, stack light and these uh, safety measures. So now after we've talked about the, the machine, how it's designed to be safe and uh, that it's not harmful for the operators and for the food, uh, we want to talk about what can you detect using the X-ray inspection technology. And there uh, I would start simple with the so-called single energy X-ray machine, which is a, yeah, a standard or early form of such a machine. It uses 
one generator for X-rays and just one detector, which is typically a, a line of, of uh, X-ray sensitive um, material and photodiodes uh, receiving the X-rays and forming an image as the product passes. And such a system especially will find contaminants which are denser than the food inside, which would be metal, uh, glass, um, calcified bones of a certain thickness, uh, uh, mineral stones, and also some high density plastic or rubber materials. And if we look further, there may be applications where this is not sufficient. For example, here you see a nice X-ray image of a uh, box with pasta inside and the pasta is standing upright and li lying down, being all over the place. And it's really hard uh, to tell that there's contaminants introduced. So you see a few dots, which are from glass, uh, which are like the largest one would be five millimeters, four millimeters, three millimeters. These are spheres which are used as a test contaminant to test the de X-ray detection. And on the bottom, there's also stainless steel, which is a little bit darker and also two millimeter, 1.5, one millimeter. But for example, um, in this type of image, you wouldn't see a two millimeter piece of glass simply because the, the contrast of the pasta is there. So the traditional X-ray um, is probably incapable of doing thin glass, lower density plastics and rubbers, small stones and rocks and uh, these types of contaminants. Uh, and that's because in challenging products, you have a lot of variation of thickness or product is overlapping. And uh, so we need for, uh, to look for a different technology. And that was found in the uh, security sector. They created the so-called material discrimination X-ray, MDX, which was pioneered in the 1990s to find weapons and explosives. Uh, and on the bottom, you see an example image. Um, this technology is able to distinguish between different materials. And that's made by taking X-ray images at different X-ray energies, at two energies. So we call it dual energy technology. And uh, doing this, you can compute uh, information which material you have. And in the image below, you can see that there's black parts like the engine and the rims of the uh, trailer. And these are dark. And also somewhere in the image, there's also some weapons which also contain a lot of metal. So they, they are um, absorbing X-rays a lot. And in the dual energy technology, you can distinguish this is some, some steel uh, and the trailer is made of, for example, aluminum and the, the goods inside are also uh, different materials. So this can be shown with color coding. And in 2007, the food processors started to adopt the MDX technology for X-ray inspection in food. And I'm going to explain a little more how this works. Um, the MDX technology is using two different X-ray energies when it um, creates the image of the food. And we see here a graph which shows the X-ray attenuation of different materials. And uh, on the left, uh, on the X-axis, you find the energy of the X-rays, photon energy. And on the Y-axis, you uh, find the coefficient of absorption. And you will see for all the materials at low energy of the X-rays, the absorption rate is higher. And on the right side, um, when the energy gets high, the absorption of the X-rays goes down. So this is the one thing, lower energy, stronger absorption, higher energy, lower absorption. But also the, the amount of the absorption itself is different for the materials. So on the bottom, there's for example, water, which is close to a lot of food products or even contained in the food. And then there's also PE plastics, which is very similar to food. These have low absorption and uh, it's already low at low energy, but much lower at high energy. And then on the top, you see the, the red curve is iron and there's also copper. They absorb like three orders of mag magnitude. Uh, yeah, one time, one thousand times more uh, the X-rays compared to the water and food stuff. So these normally are easy to capture just because of the uh, contrast they form. But the other materials in between, like borosilicate glass, aluminum, 
and for example PTFE plastics. Um, these have uh, absorption somewhere in between the food and the metals and still for these materials the low energy absorption is different from the high energy absorption and the dual energy basically takes an image at low energy and one at high energy and from these two images you can compute a material image and this is then can distinguish between the material of low absorption with which is just a little thicker or thinner and a material which is uh, having a stronger absorption and when you combine these you will get a, a image like this uh, on top there's a standard x-ray image single energy uh, pieces of chocolate, chocolate candy, and some piece of glass. And with the MDX, you are now able to remove all the chocolate and find the glass which is higher absorbing. So in this image, you, uh, you can see the glass easily. On the top image, you couldn't spot it at all. So the MDX technology helps if the product is uh, yeah, quite dense or has a lot of thickness variation and it's not easy to spot contaminants. It can find just by analyzing the material, whether there's a contaminant. And that's especially helpful if you have uh, randomly oriented products or products which overlap, because then the thick thickness is not the same. So if you always have a, one product with the same thickness, it's easier to find a contaminant because you can just set a threshold in your image and everything which is darker could be a contaminant. But then if you have products which can overlap, for example, pieces of meat which can lie on top of each other, they may be darker, not because there's a contaminant, but it's a material, uh, because it's a thicker material. And MDX helps to yeah, avoid false rejects by really telling which material is in there. And um, yeah, following this, we make an X course on the uh, bone detection. So can I detect bones with X-ray? And you would say probably yes. Medical X-rays is also used to check whether your bones are still all right after you had an accident or similar things. But uh, going to smaller bones for conventional X-ray machines, this can be challenging. And for this reason, um, Eagle developed a technology which we call performance x-ray technology, PXT, which is a, a evolution of the MDX I explained before, but especially focusing on bone. And the change is um, bone is mainly containing calcium as a material you can detect, but also bones are not, not rigid, but often hollow or filled with blood or water. So um, bone is not, one bone is not like the other. And the main thing is, can we be sensitive enough to get the, the calcium in the bone detected? And um, this is especially challenging when you look at, for example, poultry, which doesn't live very long. So there's chickens only uh, four to six weeks old before they get slaughtered. And uh, so there's not much time to build up the calcium over the life. And uh, with the PXT technology, we have improved the detection performance and we are finding bones down to one millimeter in thickness, sometimes even a little bit less for many applications in poultry. And also it works uh, based on the material. And so um, the, uh, the bone detection works fine also when the product overlaps and is not ordered well. And this is an example image from such an x-ray. It's a piece of, uh, I think, deboned chicken thigh. And you see the, the conventional single energy x-ray on top. There's darker and brighter areas. This is because the product is thicker in some areas than in others. And there's two bones in there, which are only a little bit under two millimeters in thickness. And you wouldn't be able to spot them just by looking at the contrast because there's much darker areas. But with the, the image processing from the PXT, um, you see in the bottom that there's really two dark spots uh, sticking out in the image, which are the bones which ha are different material. So uh, PXT helps to distinguish between material differences and uh, thickness of the product and is very sensitive in bone detection. Here's another nice example. This is a, a piece of chicken breast where there's so-called fan bones and rib bones. So we have plenty of bones tag 
and uh, the thinnest of them are yeah under two millimeter thick and just flat so it's also a difference for the x-ray if the bone is is uh, somehow upright and the x-rays penetrate the bone in the length or whether it's just flat and you uh, shoot through it uh, while it's flat in your product because then the the uh, length of uh, bone uh, through which your x-rays travel and get absorbed is lower and yeah this is an imp impressive example um, the PXC technology is not restricted to bone alone, but it also helps a lot looking for the smallest pieces of rock, low mineral glass, um, and was also great improvement on aluminum detection. So smaller pieces of aluminum and tiny wires of stainless steel, also some types of rubber like MBR, EPDM, and so on uh, can be well detected with this technology in many, many applications. And here's another example which is especially challenging for x-rays it's fish bones they are very thin so uh, the resolution of the x-ray and the um, size of the bones are yeah in a very similar order and on top you see a standard x-ray image and you wouldn't spot a lot of fish bones in there and on the bottom that's the pxt image processed for the material information and you see plenty of bones which have been tagged with this technology and they are roughly half a millimeter, some even only down to 0.2 millimeters. So um, now coming from bones to meat, there's another technology which can be done with X-ray. That's inline fat analysis. And what does this mean? Uh, you can run uh, fat, uh, meat through an X-ray machine and at the same time measure contaminants and measure the uh, fat content of this meat. So um, this helps you to find out um, how, how, high, uh, how large is the fat percentage in your meat, which is a, a key value for the price of the meat. And uh, normally the leaner the meat gets, the, the more expensive it is. And when you can rate it and certify meat has a certain amount of uh, yeah, fat or um, the other value is so-called chemical lean, which is everything except the fat. So low fat content, high CL number, chemical lean number, would mean you have a very valuable meat. And at the same time, we can measure the mass of the meat and calculate the weight and calculate protein, moisture, and uh, still do the contaminant detection. And how does this work? So it's so-called, uh, we call it uh, DEXA. It's uh, dual energy X-ray absorptometry. And it uses, again, dual energy X-rays, so two uh, X-ray energies, and uh, material is, is discriminated by the two X-ray energies. And it's non-invasive, so it's done as the product passes your X-ray machine, and it doesn't just work on uh, boneless meat or ground meat. Uh, it can be used to inspect all kinds of yeah, natural meat, which is not not cooked and uh, can be trim. It can be uh, even frozen meat and can be all, all types. So some uh, customers even inspect meat with bone inside and still um, find the, the fat value and the chemical lean value. And the accuracy is roughly plus minus 1%. So uh, it's normally as good as uh, your laboratory uh, inspection or the NIR measurements you can do. But often when you do uh, quality checks on meat, like with NIR, you take a small grab sample and uh, have maybe a few hundred grams of meat analyzed. And with the... Uh, um, Inline technology with X-ray, you can measure 100% of your meat. Um, this can be yeah several tons, 40 tons an hour and more on one single machine. So you get 100% inspection and grading of your food. And it works again with shining X-rays through the product as it passes the X-ray source. We have two uh, detector arrays, line, line detectors, and one is um, responding to yeah, 70 kV and the other one to more or less 140 kV X-ray energy 
roughly. So we get two images at the same time. And um, from these two images, we can again calculate the material and conclude what the chemical lean and what the fat value is. And benefits of this DEXA technology is um, first checking that the meat is accurately priced. So either you, you're packing meat to export it or sell it, you can make sure uh, you, you are selling what you've specified. And also as a processor buying some meat, you can make sure what you have purchased is matching what you have been paid for. And then when you uh, use the meat to blend, um, you can set a target and uh, make sure you you hit this target and you don't downgrade it by adding too much fat. Um, you can produce consistently if you need to um, reach certain values for your recipes to get the same taste, for example. You want to have a, a constant percentage of fat versus lean meat, and this can be hit. You can rate your suppliers according to the quality received and also the product safety uh, uh, is helped a lot because at the same time we get the contaminant detection and can find yeah bones or metal contaminants and so on and the results are available in real time so downstream the x-ray machine they can be blending or uh, any other processing which takes the the cl readings and processes them and you can also uh, track the information and store it for uh, future use. So talking about meat and bones, now is there anything else we can do with X-ray machines? And yes, there's a lot. We can uh, do a lot of checks simultaneously. So not just doing one thing, uh, looking for contaminants, but at the same time, we can measure the mass and determine the weight of a product. We can monitor fill levels. Um, we can count items and identify missing or damaged items. And uh, yeah, even um, seals can be inspected whether there's food entrapped there and seals are broken. And the results of your expert inspection can be made available in your factory for downstream processing, for example. So let's look a little more in the detail. The mass measurements. Um, the X-ray machine can determine how many, much X-rays are absorbed by the product and basically calculate kind of 3D image. And uh, in this image, you can measure or you can use this image to measure the weight of your product. And this can be done locally. For example, on the bottom, you see uh, x-ray image of four donuts and they've been x-rayed and there's a certain amount of jam inside. And you can define an area and check the weight in this area. And if there's too little jam, normally you wouldn't know <laughs> unless you eat it, but the x-ray can tell you uh, there's an underfill and uh, so you can reject it and yeah, don't deliver it to a customer. Or uh, it would also tell you if it's overfilling, so you're giving away too much gem in your product, uh, causing you higher costs. And then here's also an example. There's at the same time a contaminant being tagged. So um, that's an, one example of the mass measurement. Another nice example would be this one here. Uh, it's a ready meal with two compartments, one containing rice and the other one uh, some sauce and perhaps meat. And um, now you can individually check um, the weight um, of both compartments. And it's just just done by, by the X-ray absorption in the area of the image. And... Um, this helps you to decide like the gross weight is okay, but the rice compartment is underfilled. So you, you don't want to deliver this, you want to reject this. And with a check weigher, you could, could just get one weight reading and here you can uh, determine the mass of either compartments individually because it's done on the image and not on just measuring one weight value for the whole package. And the other, um, option is, for example, fill level inspection, where you uh, uh, really have your jar and you image it and you check is the filling level um, matching your requirement. So 
Um, on the left side, there's a pile of yogurt, which is underfilled a little, and therefore it is tagged and will be rejected. And on the right side, uh, you see it's not restricted to liquids. Can be anything. For example, here's a tube with some crisps inside, and they are under the required level, so your package can be rejected as well. So uh, it's yeah done in the 2D image of the product, and you can define your minimum maximum level and all products out of these uh, range will be rejected. And then there's here's another nice example. You have a tray of yogurts. It's always six yogurts together. And again, the check layer could you only could only tell you the gross weight of all six. But when you use X-ray and you individually check in your image the the mass which is in each uh, yogurt, you can have the fill level, and you could uh, sense that, for example, you have five overfilled and one underfilled, and the, the gross weight would be okay, but there's one underfill which you couldn't detect detect by just using the check wire. So that's a huge benefit of X-ray inspection. Then, uh, yeah, we can identify damaged or missing items. On top, you see image of burger patties, and there's a void inside. So uh, less x-rays get absorbed. It's a bright spot in your image, and you know there's some air bubble, and you would reject this. And the other thing is analyzing the geometry. You can uh, detect the size, basically, x, y coordinates, and then also check uh, is it a round shape or not. And in this this example, it's malformed, has been uh, squeezed or dented, but um, can be also uh, done not just to single patties, but to complete packages, whether they are deformed. You can detect it and reject it if it's exceeding a certain limit. And then uh, there's the identification of missing items. So you can count. Um, for example, on the left side, there's a package of sausage or two packages. The right image counts six sausages. The left image only counts five. So you can uh, reject this and make sure, even after you've sealed the package, uh, that there's uh, exactly the amount of product in there you want to have. And it doesn't have to be sausages. It can be uh, yeah, checking whether a package for uh, uh, like asthma inhalers or something, there's a, the, the seeding clip inside or yeah, looking really is the page assembled completely or is any part missing. So it must uh, it's not necessary that it is always the same part, like uh, 10 sausages of the same form and size, but it can be different things placed in different spots of the package. The image analysis can detect, is it here or is it not? So you can count really objects. And on the right side, there's an example of a um, bottle with the cap which is missing. So you can detect this even in high-speed bottling lines, which uh, probably are challenging to uh, see it by eye. And also the fill level inspection I showed before uh, is, is uh, really nice because it works in uh, products in um, packages which are not transparent, so could be even metal cans and you could still get the fill level accurately. And next is the package integrity. So uh, here there's a X-ray image of a uh, cheese which has been cut into slices and then sealed in plastics. And some of the cheese ended up being in the seal. So we can inspect this area where the seal is, whether there's additional absorption here, for example, as small as one millimeter of cheese caught in the seals, and we can then reject it because if there's product in the sealing, you would expect the sealing is bad and the product will not reach, us, reach the self shelf life. And then uh, yeah, you can have your X-ray machine talk, so you can connect it in your factory and not just get a, a rating like every product is a pass or a reject, but you can record uh, X-ray images, store it in databases, and 
prove really your product is compliant and uh, make it traceable. You can have barcodes on your product, which is scanned when it's entering the X-ray or for example, lot numbers or serial numbers can be scanned and stored together with the X-ray image. And this way you can make sure if there's complaints, whether the product uh, left your factory uh, in a good shape or whether there was something um, problematic, yeah. And then the CL measurements also uh, allow you real-time um, feedback to other machines which do the blending or mixing of meat or which request further raw material from your stores to uh, achieve a certain production target. And this can be done using some field bus. There's another option we call filler feedback. So we said we can check a fill level, but we can also sense is the product being overfilled or underfilled. And we could tell the filling machine uh, to add more product or use less product um, in real time to always get the exact filling result. And also uh, your production data can be made available, for example, using the OPC UA protocol for SCADA systems or anything else, data evaluation in your fab, checking your yield rates and so on. And now we come to the accuracy of the X-ray detection, which is always a, a great question, like how, how likely is it that I can take this contaminant in the X-ray image? And we talk about the so-called POD, probability of detection, and it's defined as the likelihood that the X-ray system will detect a certain contaminant based on experimental data. And if, when you, uh, yeah, by X-ray system, normally you have your specification, what you need to detect and which POD you will require. And normally, um, yeah, you shouldn't claim 100% POD unless it's a really, really thick contaminant which will be detected. But once it's get, getting critical, it's a small contaminant, then a lot of variations may happen. Your product may vary a little bit. And so it makes really hard to prove it on a small number of samples. So if you want to prove 99% POD, you would need to scan the, the package roughly 380 times from, from my calculations just to have enough, enough probability to provide evidence for 99% POD. And that would be just one package. And now in your fab, you have varying packages a lot and you would need to scan multiple products. So it would be a really high number of experiments you need to do. So realistically, we talk about scanning 30 items and we can give you 95% POD roughly uh, when the product being scanned is representative for what you have in, in your production. And how does, or what does contribute to the POD? There's different um, properties of the X-rays. Um, for example, when you generate X-rays, it follows some statistical process uh, in the X-ray generator and the amount of X-rays gener generated follows a Poisson distribution or Poisson statistics. So it means there's some noise over time and uh, the number of X-ray photons arriving on the detector will vary a little just from the principle how X-rays are generated. So this is some noise. Also the detector needs to amplify the signal and has some electrical noise. And then um, when you scan a product at a certain speed, you have a certain exposure time on your detector. And the faster you need to scan, the shorter the exposure is. And so it, uh, there's less, less X-rays to be evaluated and your detection level will then be uh, lower as well. It's like if you take an image with a camera, if it's very dark, you need to expose, expose the picture uh, a little longer to get a decent image. And with X-ray, it's the same. If you have too little x-rays because you're just exposing very fast, the product is traveling fast, you will probably get less contrast and less detection rate. And then variations in the product itself, like the filling level and the type of package um, can vary. For example, when we ran experiments with glass, we often found that the glass jars really have differences in millimeters, uh, how they are made from the manufacturer, which also affect the minimum sensitivity you can get in there um, just because the product is changing or the, the jar is changing. So um, this this explains why the detection level for a certain contaminant on a given machine will depend on the product itself, on the X-ray system and the application speed. So there's a 
way to measure the detection rate. And you can uh, yeah, imagine the, your Excel machine, it's scanning a product and then it gives you a rating. Either it has detected something, which is a contaminant, that would be a positive, um, yeah, as a uh, detected product and you would eject it from the line. Or you don't detect anything, that's a negative. And if you have a detection, that could be there's a contaminant in there or it was a false decision, it's a false positive. So we have two positives and false positives. And also in the negative products, you have true negatives, which are the good products, which don't have a contaminant and are not rated to have a contaminant and also false negatives, which would be contaminants you haven't found. And from these, you can um, calculate certain performance numbers. One is the so-called true positive rate, or it's also called sensitivity or recall. And it tells you how many of the contaminants uh, you will pick up. So either a contaminant would be a false negative or a true positive, and the TPR uh, true positive rate is computed as the true positives over true positive plus false negatives. And Ideally, you would want to have a 100% yeah, true positive rate because if it's uh, too, uh, lower than 100%, you are missing contaminants. And then the false positive rate, FPR is the same. It tells you how, uh, but for the false positives, tells you how many of your good products are rated false positive. So you want a low false positive rate. And then there's other... Uh, yeah, values you can calculate the true negative rate, or it's also referred to as a specific specificity. Um, TNR, the false negative rate, which would be the missed contaminants among all contaminants, and some combined numbers like the accuracy and the precision. And um, I will focus for now on the true positive and false positive rate because they, they give you a nice answer. If you only look at the accuracy, for example, if you have only few contaminants, but uh, hundred thousands of good products, then you may have still a high accuracy, but because there's little uh, contaminants, you can even miss them and your accuracy is still good. So looking at the true positive and false positive, um, there's one way of showing this. It's called the receiver operator characteristics curve, ROC. And this plots on the y-axis the true positive rate and on the x-axis the false positive rate. And now if you wouldn't have an X-ray machine, you just have a product and you don't know anything about it, you could throw a coin to decide is it a reject or a pass. So you're 50% right, 50% false. And uh, that would be the yellow dot in the center. And um, now, knowing nothing, you could also decide, oh, well, I'm going to kick out all my products so no contaminant passes. But yes, <laughs> you have 100% true positive rate because all contaminants are found. But at the same time, you also reject all good products, so 100% false positive rate. And the, the opposite would be rejecting nothing, so you don't get true positives and you don't get false positives. That's if you don't have an X-ray machine. That's the yellow curve. And now the X-ray machine, if it was working perfect, would be here the red dot, would get you 100% true positives and 0% false positives. But technically, this is challenging, at least, if you're looking at, at small contaminants. I mean, if you're talking about 20 millimeters of stainless steel or something, Maybe yes, but if we are go going down to sub-millimeter contaminants, then uh, it's challenging. And so you get a curve, for example, the blue one would be a good machine and the green one would be a yeah, machine which is not so good. Uh, the closer you are operating to the red dot, the better your machine is. And it also tells you um, there's a price. If you want to detect many contaminants, uh, then uh, the likelihood to get a false positive is increased. So with a high true positive rate, also the false positive rate increases. 
And the opposite, when you set the machine to have a very low false positive rate, it's also more likely to miss a contaminant, so the true positive rate drops. And between the two extremes, you can mostly tune the machine by changing software settings, image parameters, and so on. But the, where this curve lives is also a little bit a question of the quality of your X-ray machine. So whether you have a good detector or MDX versus single energy and so on. So there are differences between the machines and these plots can help you to find a very good system. And then I'm going to talk a bit about the variables which affect the sensitivity for contaminant detection. So uh, there's mainly three things. One is the characteristics of the product and the application you're running. Second, the packaging, packaging design or type. And third, the design of your X-ray system. And changing any of them will change your inspection results. So they should be uh, selected uh, accordingly. And um, this is the product characteristics. So here you see uh, what contributes to this. So one would be the chemical composition of your product. So what's inside the ingredients, then the product density and the depth of the product. Um, like, a, for example, if you have meat, this may absorb stronger than just having a yeah, some, some bread or something which has voids inside. Uh, then you have the product packaging uh, and whether it's consistently in the package and on the belt or whether it's some random oriented uh, product. Um, then the process speed, um, the faster you scan, the less X-ray dose and the less measurement time you have. So you get more noise on the detector and your, your detection threshold may vary. The, Texture of the product can also change things and the location of the contaminant inside the product is important. And also when you consider your application, you should look where can I place my X-ray machine? So there's different uh, ideas having, for example, the um, inspection of incoming raw materials and it helps you to detect contaminants before they enter your process line. You, you can avoid uh, damaging your equipment if stones or metal contaminants get in there and you also um, avoid uh, having contaminants in your process line uh, if, uh, yeah, getting mixed in with, with other raw materials and perhaps damaging your product may. Um, and you can at the same time measure the, the raw materials entering your product line, uh, such as the fat lean ratio and so on. So this information can be used throughout the process. And then the other idea is have it at the end of the packaging line when the goods get packaged and shipped and you check whether all the products meet your quality standards and you can um, make it traceable, save the images and so on. And there's two other considerations I have here. One is, for example, um, the idea you need to validate it, the X-ray machine. So you put through test contaminants on a, in a fixed time interval and you make sure the contaminants get rejected. If they don't get rejected, you need to check what's wrong with your X-ray machine or with your application. And you should uh, then be able to uh, separate all the products you have inspected after the last uh, validation, which uh, pa was passed, uh, to reinspect them to make sure the machine is working to the standards you specify. And there's another requirement we often see. Uh, if you have a product and you, you tag it as a reject, um, then you want to make sure it gets removed from the conveyor belt. And this can be done by supervising the, the rejector and the, the belt with the stream of good products to really uh, check that the product which ought to be rejected is removed and ends up in the bin. And then another yeah, uh, part of the application, the product itself, density and depth. Here's two X-ray images, one of a loaf of bread and the other one of uh, uh, cheese. And the bread has lots of voids, has a bright X-ray image and it's easy to spot contaminants and the cheese is much darker. Uh, the contrast for the contaminant of the same size is much lower, so it's uh, hard to get the same POD for the cheese than for the bread. And also it may necessary to operate the X-rays at higher energy, increasing the 
so-called KV number, the discharge voltage of your X-ray tube, to get X-rays which have sufficient energy to penetrate the thick, high-absorbing sample. And then the texture of your product also changes the uh, POD and the detection results. For example, here you see a jar of peanut butter, which looks homogeneous. It's all <laughs> the same uh, material around, so any contrast uh, in there caused by a contaminant can easily be detected. So that's that's a nice product. And uh, if it's presented consistently, the, the jars are all oriented the same. Uh, that's nice task but then you have these types of packages where there's cereals inside and they are yeah scattered all over the place there's thicker and thinner uh, areas and also different ingredients absorbing x-rays differently and in this image um, it's hard to tag the the contaminant as i also explained earlier with the signal energy so you might look for like the dual energy or mdx technology and um for these type of samples, you always need to make sure the energy of the X-rays you radiate through it is sufficient that you penetrate the product. You get some X-ray signal after it, the X-rays have passed the product. Because if it's getting dark, you could have a contaminant on top and it would still be dark. So the X-rays need to be uh, sufficiently uh, high in energy to penetrate the product at the thickest location. And then... Uh, on the other hand, when you increase the KV, the energy of the X-rays, uh, the very thin layers of product and the very low density contaminants may just be missed because you you uh, over penetrate it and it, it gets too bright, so it, it's no longer detectable. So it really requires you to configure the KV number to match your product to get the optimum detection results. Too little KV may not be enough to to inspect the product at the thickest places, but too little, uh, too high KV can then uh, also screw up your detection rates. And next, when you run tests, uh, the detection rates may vary on the placement of the contaminants. So if you have this type of test contaminants, test cards, you can put them on top of a product. And um, it's easy to do, but it adds a certain thickness of material. So uh, the area where the contaminant is will absorb more x-rays, no matter whether it's just the contaminant or it's um, additional material. And this makes it easier to find the contaminant if it's just added on top. But if you really embed it somewhere, for example, put it in the jar, uh, then it displaces your product. So the X-ray machine will not sense that there's more material, but it will only sense that the material has been displaced by a contaminant. And so you just have the a smaller uh, signal from the contaminant, which is then harder to detect in your image processing. But it's the, the real world. Normally your contaminant is in the product, not on the product. And then depending on the packaging, it may be easier in the center of the product May you have less disturbance in the image from the from the packaging uh, to find the contaminant there, but uh, then technologies like the MDX is also capable of uh, yeah, removing packaging material in the X-ray image and detect it consistently, independent of the location in the product. And you should put your contaminants anywhere in the product to get the real POD number, not just somewhere on top. And then your packaging type also call, uh, has an effect on the detection rates. So, for example, if you have foil trays, the um, edges can be very dense because uh, they the X-ray run parallel to the edge, at, um, and this causes a lot of X-ray absorption. So the the uh, surroundings are very dark. Uh, metal cans have have often like pull tabs or uh, the lids can be challenging because there's additional material which normally could be seen as a contaminant but needs then to be taken care of. So on the bottom you see some can of tuna and there's some some inlay image which has been enlarged because there's contaminants you need to to be able to find and you need to inspect separately from the pull tab <laughs> and not to reject the, the can of tuna because of the uh, pull tab, but because of the contaminant. And all these types of features can really uh, have an impact on the uh, POD. 
And yeah, it's important you have a good software on your X-ray imaging tool for the uh, evaluation of the image to, to be able to process these areas independently. And uh, yeah, finally, there's uh, differences in the system design. So most machines um, work with a single beam and they shoot, for example, from top to bottom or from bottom to top through the X-ray and the, uh, through the product and the product is running on a conveyor belt. Uh, but there's other applications which may require shooting from the side and uh, for example with, with rigid containers, cans and so on, we use this technology often and we use then dual and a, a dual view machines which have a, one x-ray generator which emits x-ray beams under two different angles and these can create two different views of the product. So there's two beams, two detectors, two images and these can then be used to check different parts or uh, the product can be checked under different angles and this helps to get the POD up. And then the premium for some application is then the four beam technology uh, which uses uh, four x-ray beams and four generators. So there's four images formed per product passing the x-ray machine and we uh, then can evaluate for example if the, the base and the sidewall and the neck of the bottle uh, have different properties we can tune it to get the optimum detection in all of these or sometimes you cannot see under one angle a contaminant because you're hitting through the wall of the product but or through the base of the product but under a different angle contaminants can be seen much easier and the POD is better. Yeah, and this brings us to the end and the Q&A session. Hey, brilliant, thanks very much Guido. Uh, I'm just gonna put in the sidebar, um, I'm just gonna pop it in now. Um, let's just end the slides, okay. There we go. Yeah, so in the sidebar now, there's, uh, you can see an image and a button um, to most, uh, oh, sorry, uh, can you see that? Top, the top 10 frequently asked questions for x-ray inspection. Uh, if you click download there, that'll open a new window where you can actually um, uh, get that uh, white paper that gives a lot more details uh, and other details that, that's been provided. Is that correct, Guido? Yes, yeah, that's a, a white paper you can download and it also answers a couple of more questions we couldn't in, fit in for time reasons. So yeah, if okay. you're interested, please go ahead, download it. Okay, so you can do that now. We'll also put the link in the follow-up email and you will in the follow-up email get the slides, the recording, uh, your certificate and we'll put a link to that white paper. Okay, mm -hmm. so let's go through some of the, the questions. I'll yeah. highlight them for you so you can see them. Uh, so from Eric, uh, can food be turned unsafe when exposed to enough radiation x-ray? Uh, not with an x-ray inspection system. So the, the dose here is, is much lower uh, than like if you irradiate food and um, that no the WHO has approved it, it it's still organic and uh, you yeah don't harm it and you must consider like uh, people undergoing a medical x-ray that's a live organism and so the, there you get get radiated but the food is, is dead so there's there's nothing living so even even if x-ray caused defects uh, then uh, that, that couldn't couldn't grow or yeah so it's it's dead material so okay. for example uh, when you go on a domestic flight you take your backpack you have an apple in there it goes through the the x-ray scanner and nobody would would consider not eating it anymore uh, because baggage inspection also uses x-ray and it's, yeah. it's safe so no okay thank you um and then we've got justice does x-ray detection apply to all kind of food products or it works better on some products compared to other products i think you answered that uh, yes yeah so it depends a lot on what you're looking for in terms of contaminant and also the thickness of the product so normally you get a uh, higher sensitivity when you have a thinner layer of product and yeah it would be worth testing which which product you you would you're interested in so perhaps you can email this and then we can look more in detail okay yeah uh, uh, 
So, same question. Uh, uh, okay, uh, question now from Krista. Um, are there size limits to what X-ray can detect? For metal detection, we have limits for different types of metal, but didn't know if the same is applicable for X-ray. Yes. Um, so compared to metal detection, uh, we can do better on non-conducting things like glass and so on. So you would fight with the metal detector probably. But then among the metal, I showed the curve with the absorption in the beginning. So this shows, for example, stainless steel, copper, and those metals will be much easier to detect than, for example, aluminum. But uh, it really depends on the resolution of your X-ray detector and the, the strength of the X-ray source, what actually you can get in size. So if you talk about like 20 centimeters of, of meat, then you can get stainless steel in yeah, three, four millimeters. But if you look in single chicken fillets, you are uh, well below one millimeter. And uh, yeah, that's okay. just to, to give an idea. And then for aluminum, uh, you would end up with a larger size, but still um, get a good detection. Okay. Uh, just this, is it possible to apply x-ray technology on liquid pipe products like ice cream or vegetable oils? Yes. Um, so, for example, we have a machine designed for, for pipe and um, it's, it's used uh, on products which are pumped. The rejection of the product is a little bit more tricky since you then have to, uh, yeah, get out some liquid out of the pipe but in general it's possible there's machines and then it depends there's different diameters like uh, I think four inch pipeline or yeah if it needed to be thicker yeah, like you can inquire about it yeah uh, what about detecting things like hair no possible? I think hair is too close and too too yeah. tiny so you would would need a lot of time to expose it so I think in in yes in experimental uh, standing still uh, laboratories you can do it but not on high high speed production lines no okay uh, gerald the example was using x-ray to measure protein fat moisture etc does this work for a complex food product composed of a number of ingredients um so uh, you could perhaps get an like an overall fat number but but not for individual in ingredients and then it, it depends a little bit on the processing state for example the the fat analysis can be affected if there's a lot of salt added and uh, so one would need to look at the product itself um, like is it natural ingredients or is it already processed a lot uh, going back to difficult to detect things, what about insects, larvae, eggs? That not possible. It's like uh, animals, it, it depends. So um, normally, uh, I think Kyle was talking here recently. He he would say no, but we have all, uh, sometimes seen like in, you can find caterpillars in salad and so on. It really right. depends on the application. Okay. Um, Another question sort of along that lines. Uh, Nancy, there are instances when less de dense contaminants are not rejected by x-ray but captured through image. What can be done to make it rejectable? Um, it depends. So, I mean, for example, we, we have have software options to even detect voids. Like uh, there's toast spreads where you have air bubbles, which are also lower density than the surrounding material. So I think it, it, you need to look in your image processing whether there's options to, to do this on the X-ray machine. Okay. And a uh, question from Paolo. Uh, can X-ray detect glass particles in a product bottled in this material? Some packing products don't have the same density in all the surface, for example, in certain glass jars, bottom has a higher density. Is it mm -hmm. possible to detect a contaminant at the bottom? Yeah, so um, for example, I, I told about like multi-view machines, which then can shoot under different angles. So you perhaps wouldn't radiate through the bottom from from just one angle, but get a different angle. So you would, would have a good chance to, to hit the contaminant. And uh, yeah, one one challenge often is the so-called glass and glass. So that's a glass bottle with with some glass contaminant, and it really depends a lot on the spec of your bottle versus the size of glass you're looking for. But in general, it's doable, and also really high speed, so uh, 100 meters per minute and more in the bottling line is, is no problem. Okay. Uh, 
Dean. Uh, hi, Guido. I work for a confectionery factory producing lollipops. Using the X-ray technology, is it possible to detect the quantity of lollipops in a packet? I, I'm very sure X-ray technology detects plastic, metal, glass, etc. Yeah. Um, so, are they um, with a fixed location or just random? <laughs> Then if they're random, probably it depends a little how thick the package is. But if they would be like in stick to fixed locations, as you see them sometimes on the on the counters in the supermarket, then it's very easy, I guess. Right. And one from Zurich. Uh, how effective is this technology on various types and densities of plastics? Again, um, plastic is uh, uh, varying a lot. So it's easy to get like the, the PVC or PTFE, which contain fluorine or chlorine. Um, and then on the other side, the PE, for example, often has a lower density than, than the food stuff itself. So you would need to have a very well known thickness of food to detect that there's basically less absorption. And, um, but uh, normally I would say PE or uh, um, the high, how it's called ultra high molecular weight. Uh, PE. This is um, in in dense products is a challenge. Uh, also PP, uh, polypropylene, uh, because they they don't contain any additional um, ingredients which absorb X-ray a lot different from the food product. But then uh, others, uh, everything rubber, silicon rubbers, and so on, uh, they are much easier to detect. Okay, thank you. Uh, Felicia, what is the typical validation procedure for X-ray? Um, it depends a little bit on your requirements, but yeah, often you do it like one time per shift or one time per day that you run a product with certain contaminants of a known size and you make sure it gets rejected. So the machines also have some, some special mode that they will, uh, you, you press, you want to validate the machine and then you run the contaminant so it will not be counted in your production statistics but give a, a separate validation report. And then uh, if that is all good, you can go from there. And uh, from Carrie, would the X-ray be able to detect product inside a styrofoam cooler? I guess very well, yes, because the styrofoam is, is normally low density. Um, so you can just radiate through it and it, it will probably cause very, very little absorption of X-rays. And then uh, it depends a bit on the amount of product and how it is stacked inside, but uh, I think it works very well. So for the meat inspection, we we even use meat, which is in the so-called Euro crates or E2 crates, which is some 40 by 60 centimeter plastic crate. And that's a rigid plastic material of half a millimeter or something. And that goes well. And the uh, styrofoam is contain is a bit thicker, but it contains a lot of air. So the X-ray absorption will be much lower. Okay, and a question from Scott. Uh, let me see. Do do X-rays travel in one direction, or do they scatter when product goes underneath? Um, yes, there's scatter produced in the product, and uh, the scatter also depends a little bit on the energy of the X-rays. So that's why we are using the the curtains at the inlet and the outlet of the machine, so uh, that when the product is in the beam, the the scattered X-rays does not leave the machine. And there's other types, for example, for um, bulk poultry, you don't want to have a curtain. Uh, and there you, you shape the, the entry of the X-ray machine that there's no line of sight to the product. So often it's some incline in the uh, in-feed and out-feed of the machine so that you basically cannot look to the X-ray beam and there's no way for the X-rays to, to be scattered out. Okay, uh, Bernard, Bernard, Bernard. Can you only change the KV or also the mass time? Yes, and for sure. Um, yeah, so basically the, the uh, MAS would be uh, just increasing or decreasing the, the brightness of your image. Uh, 
Um, if you change the KV at the same time, you also increase the penetration. So the, the uh, thickness of product you can go through. And uh, that is, for example, for very thick products, you really need to operate on the high KV. Um, on the other hand, you need to tune both of them so that you not not saturate your detector because then you're basically losing signal. So uh, those two can be varied independent of each other. So for example, if, if I would have a product run a certain KV, say 70 KV, and I want to speed it up to get the same image quality, I could just increase the milliamps to still get the same signal level, but with the limits of your X-ray generator. So the, the more powerful they are, the more expensive they get. And also the more shielding the machine needs to have. Okay, um, and another question from uh, Bernard. Can you start metal detection when you have X-ray or is X-ray a metal detection complementary? Uh, it depends on your product and on your specification. So I'm not an expert on the metal detectors, but uh, I think some can even detect metal dust. And th that's something probably X-ray would, would struggle with, but like normal uh, stainless steel in, in pieces or spheres or something, that would work well. And there's also some areas which uh, are much easier with X-ray. For example, if you have uh, metallized packaging, uh, I think metal detectors also have some issues with it. So then the X-ray would be clearly better. So you should check whether the X-ray machine you, you operate matches the, the spec of your metal detector and then it can uh, replace it. Okay. So I think this is, this is what <clears throat> lots of customers are also doing in the moment because they want to add more like finding not just metal, but also uh, glass or stones. They, they replace the metal detectors with X-ray. Yeah. Sure. Uh, Irina, hello. Beautiful presentation. Yeah. Very nice. May I know what test pieces do you suggest for testing bone detection effectiveness? That's a good thing because um, yeah, I've been in many trials with customers. Some really cut bones to a certain size and try to store it, but the bone then dries out over time. So it's, it's not a... Um, uh yeah for all all time in the future uh, kept constant so um some people then say they use certain ceramics or um aluminum and basically simulate a, a bone of say two millimeter thickness with some half of the thickness of ceramics but that's that needs a little bit uh tuning to your application so we, we are also in the moment looking on like standardizing some samples, which then can show consistent uh, consistency of bone detection in, in certain products. Um, but the bones are really, for example, for the chicken, uh, different from bone to bone. Some are hollow, some are yeah filled with blood and so on, which which makes them hard to be uh, represented by something else. But normally you could could look for such a material and then make a thinner layer. So you have like a conversion ratio one to three or one to uh, two uh, in, in thickness and say like if it detects half of the thickness of the bone I want to find in this material, then I'm good. Okay, uh, another one from Irina. Do you provide a training uh, and supply X-ray units to the use UAE market, United Arab Emirates market. Oh. We, requ we require the bone X-ray. Uh, the model provided failed. Um, that m must be checked with, with, I think, our sales. So if you send an email to eaglesales at eaglepi.com, they can uh, check with the local uh, requirements. Uh, a question from Renabeth. Um, can you name a supplier that can serve PXT? I mean, PXT is our brand name for Eagle, so that's... Okay. <laughs> uh, and from Marina, um, can, it, can it measure fat and moisture in dairy products or only in meat? In principle, yes. Um, so we, we had uh, trials with... with uh, oh, um, cheese, I think, but uh, that depends a little bit on if there's there's a lot of salt added and whether it's before or after the curing. So we, we would need to look at the application, but in principle, yes. Um, we just need to know the, the level. I think like if you look at milk for drinking, it's probably just 1% just one, 1 absolute fat. 
so that uh, no th yeah three percent something like this typically that could be perhaps too too high in tolerance but uh, like for cheese there's a good chance yes okay we're gonna test you now we're gonna have to go rapid fire with the questions if we want to okay. get through them so from alex what is the mass belt width and typical belt speed for x-ray inspection systems uh, it really depends so some some production lines go like two meters per second but i guess that's that's the minority and then belt speeds uh our biggest machine has a one meter belt width but then uh, you you have certain compromises you can inspect very tall products but probably not in the sub millimeter contaminants and then there's other typically uh, you are um, starting from 200 millimeter 250 something like this so okay. this range okay alex uh um what is the uh, sorry is the system fully automatic and rejecting or does it rely on human operator no uh, it's done automatically so for example in the high speed bottling line you process 15 products per second and then <laughs> nobody could follow this no uh, you have a rejector and there's also plenty of options to reject it for example you're running bulk nuts and you you will have air blast rejectors which just blow away the the stones out of the nuts or uh, you can have push arms and every, everything so there's a big variety either we supply it or a third party can supply it so the software can address it and then there's lots of options for example you can reject not just for contaminants but you can reject products with a different rejector for weight so um, it's all done automatically but you need to program it or teach it in once configure the the recipe you want for the product and then you you just start the machine and get the results okay uh smita does uh, organic certification products allow the use of x-ray inspection yes yeah so that's that what i said uh, initially and i think our sales team can also answer this more so if you send an email okay can, uh, have you experienced detection in pills, capsules, contaminants in, in those type of thing, products? Yes. So uh, some, some medical suppliers use it as well. I mean, they, they normally want to make sure for themselves that, that their substances also um, are good to be x-rayed. But then if that's not under question, for example, there's applications counting that there's sufficient numbers of pills in the blisters and yeah capsules or um syringes and so on that's no problem yeah okay um okay from andrea can you detect plastic in cakes fruit or chocolate with chocolate chips included um depends on which plastic so pe oh. probably not and i would would uh, when there's chocolate chips i would prefer using some dual energy technology and it depends. So if you have PTFE in your production line, it may very, very be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, with things like this, it's always product process specific. It's always, it, it depends. So yeah. best thing to do is reach out to, to Eagle um, yeah. um, with your specific case. Uh, maintenance procedure for an X-ray machine? Um, not so much. You will do. So, um, the main component is the generator, which uh, typically then um, can be either inspected for performance like periodically or you, you operate it until you get some, some alert. And then, so that's the two differences. Some people want to have some service options that it's checked regularly. Uh, others uh, run it until they, they see some damage, which may take years. So, and then uh, consumables is mostly the, the belts, which could wear depending on your product and uh, the the detector diodes probably have a certain lifetime but we we see now machines which are really lasting for years and years and years and you you have more problems uh, that they are still running windows xp and uh, then that the machines wouldn't uh, live for for another couple of years okay um it doesn't leave any residues or chemical change in the food uh, no yeah we know that um uh, from Javier, uh, since bones are not stable, um, mm. do you recommend a material that is similar to bones but stable, for example, zirconia? Zirconia? I haven't experimented with it. I thought it's higher absorbing, or right. metal, it's a metal. Um, yeah, I mean, some people 
do the things like with aluminum. Some others look more like uh, ceramics or uh, potassium. Okay. Uh, right. I think we get in there now. Uh, okay. Qu question from Bernard. <laughs> You've done, you done really well. Uh, <laughs> does it make sense to have consecutive X-ray detectors with other settings? So, you know, in a series, yeah. let's say. Um, normally, I wouldn't say so because um, in the image, you can have multiple uh, layer algorithms running, looking for different contaminants. So if you get get everything under the one angle you're checking, then that should be good. And it's more important than to validate that your machine is doing it. Um, exemption may be then products where you want to have a multi-view, but that can be done within one machine so that you, for example, have a bottle or something which has a, a bottom, the, they call it crown, I think, where you cannot radiate under certain angles. Otherwise, you, your x-rays get completely absorbed by the bottom and there you would use multi-view machines normally okay i think we are on the final question uh from bernard does the government ask for safety inspection like they ask in the medical sector uh it depends on where you are so some areas they will ask for example germany where i I am, you need to announce you're going to set up a machine and it will be inspected once it is set up and then recurring every five years. Uh, other areas, uh, it's different and they also allow, for example, other limits of, of remaining radiation and so on. So that's that's depending on the territory you're in. Okay, brilliant. <laughs> but but the, the guys at, at Eagle US, for example, could also tell you for, for other countries. Sure. Okay, uh, I think we're going to leave it there. Uh, uh -huh. You've done Great. brilliant, uh, absolutely fantastic content, uh, Guido, in terms of the presentation. And then we've had 30 minutes of questions. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, excellent. Have you enjoyed it? Yes, very much. Thank you. And it was really great questions. And I hope, yeah, we can perhaps follow up with, with some of the, the questions and really get a good solution to, to find those contaminants. Sure. So it's also for us important to get the feedback, what, what's required to be detected and uh, what we can do for the customers. Thanks a okay. lot. Brilliant, Guido. Well, I hope you uh, have enjoyed uh, having you on and I hope to have you on again in the near future. So thanks, have a, uh, thanks for your time and have a great weekend, Guido. Thank you, Simon. Okay, take care. Right, ladies and gents, uh, now uh, I'm going to load your certificate in the sidebar. Uh, I know we've gone over, but sometimes it's just worth it. <laughs> so there's your certificate. You can just, uh, it's an image, you can download it, um, print and sign it, or add your own name in an image editing software. We'll follow up afterwards with the recording, the slides. Uh, we'll link to the white paper so you can get a deeper uh, information. And also uh, the contact details will be there for uh, Eagle so that you can talk to your local uh, representative and talk to them about your products and process and, and get specific uh, guidance. So thanks uh, for your attendance, everybody. Um, we will see you on the next one. Have a great weekend. Take care. Bye-bye.